Thanks for coming. So my name is Amanda Pratt and um, I'm a PhD candidate in English studying psychedelic rhetoric at UW-Madison. I've been working on um, the programming for this Borghese Mellon workshop. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, today, we're excited to have you join our virtual roundtable uh, titled What's New and What's Next in the History of Psychedelic Biomedicine? Extending Conversations Backwards and Forwards. And this is the last event for 2022 in our Psychedelic Past, Presence, and Futures Borghese Mellon Workshop um, that is funded by the Center, for Human Center of the Humanities here at UW-Madison. And so the proposal for this workshop has grown out of a working group here on campus that focuses on psychedelics and psychoactives from humanities and social science disciplines. Um, and this working group also includes faculty and students from across campus, so not only English, uh, composition and rhetoric and liter literary studies. We have our liter literature professor here in the audience today, Ramzi Fawaz, um, who's teaching a really awesome course right now called Psychedelic Imaginaries, I believe. Um, and the Allen Centennial Garden, School of Human Ecology, the Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies, and then also the Latin American Caribbean Iberian Studies Program. And of course, Luke Rickert, who's in the School of Pharmacy here. And I'll have Luke, if you wanna introduce yourself and and keep going. Yeah, sure. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for being here. So I'm a associate prof in the School of Pharmacy. Um, welcome to everyone from whatever field you happen to be in, whether or not you're a scientist or in the humanities or the social sciences, really welcome. It's glad to have you a part of this conversation. Uh, I'll just say a couple more brief words about myself for uh, context and level setting. So uh, I'm part of the School of Pharmacy, but also associated with the history department at UW-Madison, also the medical school, uh, uh, and um, specifically the Med History Bioethics Program. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I helped to found the new master's program here in the School of Pharmacy, which is Psychoactive Pharmaceutical Investigation. And I also do a little bit of work uh, as an advisor for the nonprofit uh, Porta Sophia. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, the Borghese Mellon Workshop itself um, was designed and hopefully is fostering conversations about psychedelics in uh, society from both within uh, clinical science realms and outside of those realms as well as a means to generate a deeper understanding of what psychedelic studies uh, and psychedelic humanities might look like in the years ahead and how various fields in what we sort of conceptualize as a psychedelic community or psychedelic industry could look like um, in successive years. So we're deeply interested in the conversations um, around this field, but also uh, how understandings um, about intersections take place uh, and then how that's operationalized here at the School of uh, Pharmacy on the UW campus and then more generally. So Amanda, can I turn it back to you or did you want me to say more? Um, I think that wraps it up. I'll just say some quick thank yous. So thank you to the Center for Humanities, uh, Megan Messino and Marion Law, Ladd, who have helped with all kinds of logistical things for this workshop. Um, Tyler Dewar, who's here, our Zoom administrator today, Sally Gribbeth O, Kristen Falzone, who's our graphic designer for our posters, and of course, our speakers for today. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our illustrious roundtable participants now. Um, starting with Andrea Enns. So Andrea is a PhD candidate in history at Purdue University. Her research interests broadly include the history of sexuality, psychology, and the psychedelics in 20th century North America. And her dissertation studies the, effective, the affective experience of conversion therapy in Canada and the United States from 1910 to 2010. Andrew Jones um, is a PhD candidate in the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto. His dissertation examines how psychedelic drugs made their way into child psychiatry in the 1960s. And then we have Taylor Elizabeth Dysart, who is a PhD candidate in History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania, where her dissertation examines ayahuasca's entanglements with the human and life sciences in the Northwest Western Amazon from the early 20th century to the present, and in doing so, retraces the origins of psychedelic exceptionalism. 
She situates her work at the intersection of the history of science and medicine, post-colonial and feminist science studies, the global history of drugs and cultural anthropology. Her current work has received support from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy and the Wenner Gren Foundation. Next up, we have Jacob Green, who is a six year PhD student in the history department at UCLA. His work has received support from the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy, the Source Research Foundation and the Science History Institute. And last but not least, we have Jarrett Rose, who is a sociologist of mental health, medicine and psychedelic therapy. He studies the culture and social psychology of therapeutic communities and psychedelic assisted therapy retreats, attempting to understand how social and emotional connection and group dynamics impact self-transformation and healing. After completing his doctorate, Dr. Rose has taken up a year-long lectureship at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, where he recently created and is now teaching a brand new course called Psychedelic Cultures. And so I'm really excited to have you all here. Thanks for being here, and I'll pass it over to Luke to get things started. Sure. So the format for today is that we're going to turn it over to our speakers and they're going to share some thoughts and ideas for between five to seven minutes for some level setting. We're going to then launch into a more general conversation um, with the group uh, with this round table. And then we want to be as round as we possibly can uh, in the final phase. Uh, and uh, we uh, deeply encourage uh, questions um, and observations from uh, everyone out there. So uh, the idea behind this panel, which of course is called What's New, What's Next in the History of Psychedelic Biomedicine, Extending Conversations Backwards and Forwards, was to introduce and amplify uh, relatively new voices in the humanities and social sciences as a way of bringing a slightly fresh perspective on what's happening in psychedelic biomedicine, historically, as well as um, from various adjacent fields, whether or not that's anthropology or sociology. And so that's just to give you a sense of some of the rationale behind this roundtable. And like I said before, but just to reiterate, we very much encourage your uh, questions in the chat at the end uh, and or uh, via raising your hand. And I'm sure all the panelists are looking forward to having a conversation um, with you uh, as well as with each other. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, the panelists in alphabetical order in the way that, uh, it's actually not alphabetical order, I take that back, but the way in which Amanda introduced um, each of them. So Andrea, if I can turn it over to you, first of all. Absolutely, thank you so much for the generous introduction. And can everybody hear me okay, first of all? Okay, excellent, wonderful. So as Amanda mentioned, my current research examines the history of conversion therapy in the United States and Canada from 1910 to 2010. And an important part of this history, I think, is the history of psychedelic conversion therapy, particularly from the 1950s to the 1970s, using compounds like LSD, mescaline, and peyote. While this practice admittedly occupied a relatively small and marginal space on the fringes of post-war psychedelic research and experimentation, I think this history has some really important implications for our present day psychedelic renaissance. On the one hand, these historical practices encourage us to think critically and carefully about the ways that psychedelics research was and remains informed by social prejudice and power relationships. This is especially crucial considering the fact that psychedelic conversion therapies have not been historically bounded to the mid-20th century. To name one example, in his 2017 memoir, The Inheritance of Shame, which I have a copy right here, uh, Canadian activist and conversion therapy survivor Peter Guidich describes receiving non-consensual ketamine injections as part of his treatment in Victoria, British Columbia during the early to mid-1990s. Examples like this demonstrate psychedelics continuing potential for harm depending on therapeutic intent, especially among vulnerable and marginalized populations like the queer community. So where do we go from here? While this history might be dark and uncomfortable in various ways, I also believe that recognizing this painful past is essential to the development of compassionate, of compassionate and equitable psychedelics therapies and research practice in our current historical moment.
The hope that past studies might inform present day research on psychedelics therapeutic possibilities necessitates a fulsome appreciation of past actors' research decisions and therapeutic outlooks. Ignoring or downplaying the painful, harmful, and messy aspects of psychedelic research history discourages critical consideration of how these same damaging patterns might repeat themselves in modern research and in patient experiences in various institutional, temporal, and national contexts. Greater nuance is especially needed due to the overwhelming historiographical emphasis on white, college-educated, upper-middle-class, cisgender, heterosexual, male psychedelic users and experimenters in the mid to late 20th century North American context. Say that 10 times fast. This is a very, very narrow and homogenous demographic. And it's also worth mentioning here that the queer actors who typically appear as central figures in psychedelic history are also in many ways part of this narrow demographic focus. Here I'm thinking of people like Ram Dass and Allen Ginsberg, for example. But when we widen our imagination of who uses psychedelics and on what terms, we are introduced to a much broader conception of psychedelic stakeholders whose voices and perspectives should be represented not only in psychedelic historical narratives, but in modern day research practices and objectives. This is part of the reason I'm so excited by all of the research presented in this roundtable today. Each of us, I think, is working in our own way to shift the scholarly lens away from this narrow demographic focus and topic in different and interesting ways, creating a more diverse picture of psychedelic research and experimentation over time. But recognizing more diverse psychedelic populations in turn invites questions about power relationships within the psychedelic experience, especially regarding how the effective, emotional, subjective experience of psychedelic conversion therapy and other types of therapies um, demonstrate the ways that practitioner bias that can so strongly influence treatment experiences and outcomes. Psychedelic therapies, both historically and at present, often place patients in incredibly vulnerable mental states. When patients undergo ego dissolution, ab reactions, hallucinations, depersonalization, etc., this radically reshapes the balance of power between practitioners and patients in clinical settings. And this is especially true for patients who already experience social marginalization on the basis of their gender identity, race, class, age, ability, or sexuality. These populations all already also face greater risk of harm in general, given the pervasive problem of discrimination in all areas of society, including within science and medicine. The psychedelic encounter, in other words, creates intense effective states, which provide opportunities for healing and harmful practitioner interventions, including for the purposes of psychedelic conversion therapy. Addressing the painful, messy parts of this history allows humanity scholars to help ground sensationalized, overly optimistic narratives about past, present, and future research in this field. Such narratives often frame psychedelics as inherently liberatory through their historical association with radical social movements and the mid 20th century American counterculture. But even in that historical moment, psychedelics were being used in ways that directly harmed patients for very socially conservative ends, reflecting the broader psychiatric consensus that certain populations, specifically non-heteronormative people, were inherently mentally ill. So moving away from popular narratives of psychedelics as inherently good therapeutic influences might hopefully allow future researchers to think more if reflexively about their own practices and perspectives, as well as their potential impact on present day psychedelic experimental design. Additionally, recognizing psychedelics broad spectrum of potential might give biomedical and humanities scholars alike important opportunities to collaboratively develop psychedelics pedagogy using lessons from this painful past. Drawing from my own work, for example, perhaps these partnerships could involve asking how we can create and foster psychedelic research that is sensitive to the needs and desires of diverse populations whose, perfe whose perspectives sorry, have not always been a priority in this field. What does a queer positive psychedelic therapy session look like? What might queer perspectives contribute to psychedelic therapies as a whole, including those not specifically oriented to LGBTQ plus populations? What rules, guides, and limitations could or should be in place to mitigate the risk of damaging social prejudice during psychedelic treatments? And how might we challenge longstanding notions of sexual puritanism that seem to have had such a strong role in shaping historical psychedelic research paradigms? These are all ideas that might be worth ruminating as our psychedelic like Renaissance continues. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm really excited to develop these thoughts and learn more from your questions and my fellow presenters during our roundtable today. Excellent. Thanks so much.
Andrea, that's fantastic. I'm going to turn over to uh, Andrew Jones now. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for that uh, great uh, presentation of your work. And I'm really excited to be included among such wonderful panelists and in front of such a good audience. So I think what's emerging as my broad area of interest is the medical use of psychedelics in publicly funded institutional settings in 1960s North America. So for example, in state hospitals or in even correctional facilities. So my dissertation focuses on American psychiatrists who use psychedelics as a therapy for children who lived in state hospitals. These institutionalized children were usually diagnosed as autistic, schizophrenic, or severely disturbed. And the, the three professionals that I look at, they each viewed LSD and similar drugs in radically different ways. So, so for example, the child psychiatrist Loretta Bender understood childhood schizophrenia as the result of an underdeveloped nervous system. And for her, LSD was a chemotherapeutic drug. At Creedmoor State Hospital in New York, she gave children daily dosages of LSD to stimulate their development. And in some cases, children were given LSD every day for three years. So in one report that I found, the report stated that a child had received LSD for 1,366 days. And at Fairview State Hospital in California, the psychologist Gary Fisher used psych the psychedelic therapy model that we're all familiar with to help treat children. So he tried to create a comfortable setting and he used music and paintings to guide children towards transcendent positive reactions. And the psychiatrist James Q. Simmons incorporated LSD into his behavioral therapy program at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute. So for him, the positive and negative experiences generated by LSD could help children learn to associate affect with adults. So even bad trips, he claimed, could help autistic children learn how to make contact with adults since they would be motivated to seek comfort in the arms of the attending adults. So outside of my dissertation, I'm increasingly interested in looking how LSD was used in prisons. So we're probably all familiar with Larry's Concord prison experiment, but in Canada, LSD was also used to help re rehabilitate inmates. And in some cases, these studies took place before Larry's prison experiment. So one example involves the Oak Ridge Maximum Security Prison, uh, sorry, the Oak Ridge Maximum Security Psychiatric Facility in Ontario. And so in this case, psychiatrists were interested in total encounter therapy. So to break the psychological defenses of inmates who were diagnosed as psychopathic and to help them develop social relationships with each other. To this end, LSD was used as a defense disrupting drug, and the psychiatrist gave it to inmates in an eight by 12, eight by 12 foot square foot room called the total encounter capsule. But they were also interested in a form of encounter therapy that emerged from the West Coast humanistic tradition, nude psychotherapy. So the end result was giving inmates LSD and putting them in a small room for days on end while they were naked. So one of the main questions that emerges from my research is this. As humanities scholars and professionals during the current psychedelic renaissance, how should we approach or frame the history of unethical experimentation in psychedelic science? So this history is closely tied to LSD in the public consciousness. Often the academics I engage with, uh, they hear me talking about LSD and they immediately think of CIA or MKUltra. So in this way, unethical experimentation contributes to the cultural context that informs how we understand psychedelics. One way to address this issue is to distinguish between proper and improper uses of psychedelic therapy. And as so sociologists, historians, and anthropologists have shown, today's psychedelic scientists often approach the issue of mad scientists by carefully drawing boundaries between themselves and what happened in the past. So the story of Timothy Leary, for example, is often used as a way of highlighting how naive researchers were in the past and how careful they are now. But one of the things that I'm thinking about in my research is, are these boundaries really so solid? And to what extent do uh, researchers in the past kind of cross this boundary between proper and improper use of psychedelics? So another issue that I and uh, some of my co-panelists are grappling with is the use of psychedelics as normalizing tools in the 1960s. So in the psychiatric context, psychedelics were awfully close, closely tied to a medical model of disability. And in many cases, the goal of psychedelic therapy was to bring patients back in line with prevailing social norms. So why is this historical work relevant now? Like, why should we care about the past? In many ways, psychedelic therapy is still entrenched in a medical model of disability. For example, some, re some researchers are talking about using psychedelics to treat autism, but more clarification is needed here about what treatment means in this, case, in this context. In other words, what is the relationship between psychedelic therapy and neurodiversity? We can also ask whether this new wave of psychedelic science is immune to the kinds of unethical research that happened in the past. We may think that because we now have sophisticated ethical guidelines and regulations, 
that the kinds of controversial uses that happened in the past would not happen again. But what about if psychedelic therapy becomes more widespread and governments once again start considering its larger implementation in institutions such as hospitals or correctional facilities? And what impact might this use in larger facilities have on the setting and practice of psychedelic therapy? So that's all I'll say for now, and I'll turn it back to Luke. Thank you. Andrew, also excellent. Really appreciate that. Um, and we'll now turn over to Taylor Dysart. Thanks so much, Luke. Thanks, Andrew and Andrea, for setting a nice tone for the panel. Thanks, Amanda, Tyler, Luke, for all of your organizing work. Um, as Amanda mentioned, my work examines the ongoing history of ayahuasca as a global scientific object across the life and human sciences in the Northwestern Amazon throughout the 20th century. As I'm sure many of you know, since the mid 19th century, scientists have traveled to the Amazonian regions of Brazil, Colombia, and Peru from the Americas and Europe to study ayahuasca, a hallucinogenic plant-based concoction that has many different dimensions. And the peoples who lived with this powerful plant being were also subjects of study as well. This network of researchers began with botanists, geographers, and naturalists in the mid-19th century before expanding to include ethnographers, folklorists, psychiatrists, ethnobotanists, cultural anthropologists, neuroscientists, and historians. These scientists collaborated on multidisciplinary projects, organized academic conferences, shared meals together in the Amazon, and frequently wrote to and referenced one another. 19th century researchers often informed how mid and late 20th, 20th century scientists working in the Amazon saw themselves in their own work. And Richard Spruce is a classic example of this. As with many contemporary clinicians today and research scientists as well, several were convinced that ayahuasca held therapeutic potential that could be harnessed by biomedicine in ways that sometimes conflicted with its uses in the Amazon. The starting point for my research is the following question of why has ayahuasca sustained the attention of generations of multidisciplinary and transnational scientists? The second major question that follows is what were or are the consequences of ayahuasca research for Amazonian inhabitants, human and non-human? When scientists encountered ayahuasca, they often recognized its ubiquity across diverse indigenous and mestizo communities and its embeddedness in Amazonian human and non-human relationships. I ask how these communities responded to and shaped decades of intensive and recurrent research in this region. In doing so, I highlight or attempt to highlight how history of psychedelic knowledge in the Amazon was intimately tied to broader debates about modernity and indigenous dispossession, nationalism, degeneracy, and race, and the relationship between modern science and neo-traditional knowledge systems. At the same time, and in keeping with the theme of this roundtable today, I hope that my research um, and in conversation with all of you speaks to broader interdisciplinary questions about what constitutes a psychedelic renaissance. More specifically, by considering the Northwestern Amazon as a key site of psychedelic science, I wanna push back a little on the framing of a renaissance and the idea that our current moment and that of the late 1950s, 1960s were peak moments of psychedelic research. Instead, I'd like to offer a different take on psychedelic temporality by narrating the longstanding history of scientific research on psychedelics in this region, one that stretches, as I mentioned, from the mid-19th century, if not earlier, to the present. To me, this serves as a useful reminder for how different geographies and worldviews can shape the questions that historians and scientists ask. While there has certainly been an explosion of popular and scientific interest in psychedelics, I would argue that many people at the forefront of this work have, in fact, been working towards this since the mid 20th century, if not sooner, and many of them have profoundly shaped, been profoundly shaped by their relationship to the Northwestern Amazon and the scientific work that they've conducted there. One of the most salient examples of this in my work is the advent of the Bouchera rating scale. So in 1993, study in Manaus in the Brazilian state of Amazonas, researchers worked with the Union do Vegetal or UDV, a syncretic church, to measure the physiological and psychological effects of huasca a brew that's often considered analogous to ayahuasca or yahe. One of the tools used to measure the effects of huasca was proposed to be the hallucinogen rating scale, or HRS. I'm sure that some of you know that the scale was developed by Rick Strassman um, for use on DMT in the States. But for UDV members, they immediately took issue with the HRS, claiming that ayahuasca was a sacrament and not a hallucinogen. The Brazilian researchers were concerned that the term hallucinogen conveyed a sense of recreational imbibement of huasca, which they considered to be oppositional to their ritualized and spiritual environment of the vegetal. While one of the researchers preferred the term hallucinogen, another preferred psychedelic, and yet another preferred entheogen. 
Ultimately, however, neither hallucinogen nor psychedelic nor entheogen were elected as the term for this phenomenological test. Instead, the HRS was renamed the Borrachera Rating Scale. While Borrachera does not have a standard or direct translation from Portuguese, within the UDV, it's largely understood to mean the effects of the vegetal or being under the influence of the vegetal. It's likely that Borrachera derives from Borrachera, which is historically understood to refer to someone who works with rubber and now is someone who changes your tires, suggesting a reference to the birth of the UDV amidst the rubber camps along the Brazilian-Bolivian border. The researchers' willingness to reconsider Huasca through the lens of Borrachera rather than hallucinogen, psychedelic, or entheogen serves as a compelling reminder for how research subjects, quote-unquote, be they people or sacred plants, shape the professional lives of the researchers themselves. One of the things that I really like about this example is that for me, um, and hopefully for some of you, it raises interesting questions about who is a scientist and whose knowledge is recognized, speaking to these questions of power that Andrea raised a couple minutes ago. So the title of my dissertation is The Scientist in the Jaguar, Wondrous Plants and the Politics of Knowledge in the Northwestern Amazon. And first, the title is a reference to Gerardo Reichel Domatov, who's an Austrian Colombian anthropologist who did a lot of work with Yahe in the mid to late 20th century and has a book titled The Shaman in the Jaguar. But it's also an invitation to think about who is the scientist and conversely, who is transformed by ayahuasca or the jaguar. And in the example that I just mentioned, the scientists themselves experience this kind of professional transformation. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and turn it over to my fellow panelists, but I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. Amazing. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, we're on a roll. And so I'm going to turn over to uh, Jacob Green now. Thanks, Luke. And uh, thanks to all the other panelists, especially Taylor, for bringing up interdisciplinarity, which is something that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, so in 1956, C.P. Snow published an essay called Two Cultures in the New Statesman, which went on to be the basis of a book of the same title, in which he argued that there are two cultures developing and knowledge making, one based on science and one based, at least in England, on more traditional concerns with literature and things like that. However, in the same year, in 1956, uh, Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond were collaborating together. Osmond was a psychedelic scientist and Huxley was an author. And their collaboration was to coin the term psychedelic. So if you're not familiar with this, um, this term actually derives from a set of couplets that the two exchanged. Uh, Huxley wrote to Osmond to make the mundane world sublime, just a half grain of phonat time. So this is not this whole debate came from the fact as people have mentioned before that using um terms like hallucinogen and psychotomimetic uh which were traditionally associated with drugs like lsd those had bad associations so you know uh humphrey osmond and um Aldous huxley were working on reframing this so that was huxley's little contribution and then osmond quit quit back to fall and hell or so angelic you'll need a pinch of psychedelic and that's where the term psychedelic comes from. And this is a very interdisciplinary thing that's going on here. You have an author and a scientist exchanging poetic couplets that comes to form this um, term that we all use today to refer, refer to this class of drugs. And I think this just shows how deeply interdisciplinarity runs in psychedelic studies. Um, we can see it here today in this workshop, um, also at the Psychoactive Pharmaceutical Investigation Master's Degree at Madison, for example, which incorporates history as well. Um, and I, I just wanted to really appreciate the fact that interdisciplinarity is often a buzzword, but it's something that's really real when it comes to psychedelic studies. Um, but when it comes to history, it's, it's also important to recognize, as I've just mentioned, that that interdisciplinarity goes back in time to when psychedelics were first being considered in a scientific way in the 1950s and also in the late 19th century, which is uh, where my dissertation focuses. Um, and it's important for us to recognize these interdisciplinary connections for two reasons. One is that a lot of times the hidden assumptions that are in psychedelics to science today actually come from philosophy or literature. And it's important for us to recognize the origins of those assumptions to really understand how psychedelic science functions. The second is that if we look at how interdisciplinary connections between psychedelics and other fields function in the past, we might provide um, scientists or also humanists with new inspirations for understanding the nature of psychedelics. So um, I guess I'm just gonna outline one quick example of the historical thing that's that's happened recently, is that uh, the mysticism scale is something which is often used to measure mystical experience 
in psychedelic science. Um, and this scale sort of measures various things, but the idea is that it's trying to measure whether someone is having a mystical experience, which is generally defined as a feeling of oneness uh, with God. Um, and recently, scholars such as Sam Shonkoff and Ann Taves have demonstrated that, in fact, this assumption comes from a perennialist philosophy, which assumes that there's only one type of mystical experience, i.e. sort of emerging with the oneness of God. But actually, if you look at religious studies work since the 1960s, this idea has sort of been downplayed and people are recognizing their mystical experiences broader than this. So the point of this is psychedelic researchers today are using a definition of mystical experience that comes from the 1960s version of religious studies, and it really limits how they understand the nature of mystical experience and makes them ignore things like hallucinations, which a lot of people um, consider important aspects of religious experience under psychedelics. Now, in terms of own work, adding to this conversation through showing that, in fact, Hegelian philosophy has a large influence on our understanding of a total or mystical psychedelic experience as a feeling of merging or oneness with the universe. In the late 19th century, a um, number of scholars, such as William James, uh, took anesthetic drugs. There's also others, such as the chemist William Ramsey, who isolated many of the noble gases. And when they were thinking about the effects of these drugs, they thought about them in terms of Hegelian philosophy or related philosophies that believe that essentially the universe is all one thing, what Hegel referred to as the absolute. And they thought that psychedelics produced this experience that was akin to Hegelian philosophy. And actually, if you look at William James' work, this kind of becomes directly baked into how we understand mystical experience um, later in time in, in psychedelic research. Um, so uh, my work investigates that. Also, my broader project looks at intersections between philosophy, psychology, and psychic research to further sort of explore these interdisciplinary connections. And in addition to sort of, you know, like saying, oh, you know, these old assumptions from history are limiting psychedelic research, I also hope it to like broaden discussions about ways, places that people might find inspirations for understanding psychedelic experience. So today, like psychedelic experience is probably strongly associated with Buddhism, at least in a lot of cases, or Hinduism. I know Roland Griffiths, for example, who really led the major effort into investigates the mystical properties of psychedelic was involved in meditation and yoga. But psychedelic scientists might also consider reading Hegel, and they might have a different sort of view on things after doing that. And it might affect, um, you know, sort of broaden their understanding of what it means to have a feeling of merging with the oneness of the universe and things like that. So, um, yeah, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much for speaking. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to round out the round table now by uh, turning it over to uh, Jared Rose. Hi, everyone. Really stoked to be here. Thanks for putting this on, uh, Luke, especially, and, and thanks to the rest of the panelists. It's been great listening to you all and hearing about what's going on, you know, just in the, in the space generally. Um, my name is Jarrett Rose. I, uh, I just finished my PhD in August. I'm from Southern California originally, went to Canada uh, as an international student in 2016. A bunch of people said that they would leave the uh, country when Trump got elected. So I actually did it. <laughs> um, went to Toronto for a little while. But uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so right after, actually, even before uh, finishing my dissertation, I um, was hired for a year long lectureship um, over at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in uh, upstate New York, where I am now. And it's definitely uh, winter all of a sudden. Uh, which is, you know, a bit um, off-putting for for someone like me from Southern California. But I, uh, I've, I've got the jackets and the boots now after my time in Canada, so I've gotten a little bit used to it. And Andrew, it's uh, it's nice to meet you. I probably, you know, lived uh, somewhere nearby just a couple of months ago, in fact. And too bad we're only meeting now. We could have, uh, you know, collaborated. But of course, there is still time. So anyway, uh, my uh, my dissertation began about three years ago, and um, I. Um, stumbled upon a population uh, of, of people who more or less had been suffering um, a variety of, of chronic and treatment resistant forms of uh, mental distress, I'll just say broadly, and um, had all gone to a particular uh, Jamaican psilocybin assisted group therapy retreat 
And so my, my dissertation was a, uh, you know, began as um, just a, a series of almost 20 in-depth interviews with some of these folks who more or less had suffered um, various forms of mental distress for, um, for decades, actually, and, uh, and could not find resolution through orthodox medicine. And, more, you know, more or less were, um, they found themselves kind of, you know, in despair and, and hopeless um, and decided to kind of as a last ditch effort for some of these folks, uh, pursue psychedelic assisted therapy to once and for all, um, you know, reconcile some of their mental health issues. And so um, pandemic hits and then it, you know, waned a bit, depending on your particular perspective on that matter, and uh, found myself you know, fortunate and, uh, and with the opportunity to go to Jamaica and um, engage in an ethnography and a participant observation uh, of, a, um, of this same psychedelic assisted therapy retreat in Jamaica. So I was there in February and, um, you know, as well as these, um, you know, 20 or so uh, in-depth interviews with people, um, the population I just described, I was able to really um, take a look at how some of these psychedelic retreats operate. And I began to use, you know, I'm a, I'm a sociologist of, of medicine, mental health, and culture. And I began to use some of the theoretical tools in these sociological traditions as a means of making sense of and, and theorizing and analyzing how culture is sort of constructed and, and disseminated on retreats in collective settings. And then also, you know, naturally, um, internalized and then integrated into uh, participants' um, daily lives. So, you know, in, in summary, my, my dissertation, which ended up being like 350 pages, which is so strange to me because I, I tell you, I did not set out to write that much. And if anyone, you know, who's, who's writing their dissertation now wants to have a discussion about that, I'm, I'm always available to, you know, to hang out. If, if I, you know, I, I live part year back, part year back in LA. So I know that. Um, Jacob Green is in, as, um, at LA, um, you know, Andrew and, and, and so on, right? So if anyone, if we cross paths, if you want to send me an email, I'd love to chat with you about that. But um, my dissertation effectively just explored the lives of people who, like I said, were suffering with treatment resistant chronic conditions and, um, you know, attempted psychedelic therapy, right? And, um, and many of them absolutely found a lot of relief and, and personal growth. And, and then the second half of the dissertation more or less uses these, these tools in, in sociological theory to sort of make sense of like the cultural and, and social psychological components of, of what it looks like to be in a, a group-based setting for a week and to have three uh, large doses of, of psilocybin mushrooms and to you know, engage and in, in interact and engage in intersubjectivity with the rest of the participants in these um, experiences, right? So um, you know, th this sort of theoretical tradition, which is created by Randall Collins for the sociologists in the room, it's, you know, like an interaction ritual chain theory in the sort of vein of symbolic interactionism and, and Durkheim's, you know, collective effervescence and so on. But it allows us to sort of make sense of how, you know, culture and social psychology, um, you know, it, within the, the retreat setting contributes to situational behavior, social and emotional connectedness. Uh, amongst the retreat participants, um, forms of cognition, symbolic objects, the creation of particularized cultural capital, um, and, 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 you know, the contrib contribution to sufferers' new, uh, you know, behavioral and, and psychological repertoires, I guess we could say. So anyway, th that's a bit of my personal research, which is, you know, ongoing currently, um, but I've been really uh, weighed down a bit in, in publishing some of these things because I've had this like really glorious opportunity to, um, to come to RPI and uh, to teach um, main, mainly STEM students about the history of mental health, which is what I teach. I teach a course called Medicine, Culture, and Society. I teach Introduction to Sociology. And I've just created, actually, because my chair is this lovely, glorious historian of consciousness and, um, and drugs, Nancy Campbell, um, I've created a, a psychedelic cultures course at this university. So it's my first semester teaching it. It's gone so well. All of my students are new undergrads, and you know, a lot of them are, are I would consider, um, a bit psychedelic naive. 
but it's just been such a fun time and, and, um, and, and really it's been inspirational and, and um, a great learning experience for myself and for my students. So, you know, the last thing I'll say is that um, while I'm getting out, uh, you know, slowly but surely because of these new like course creations and, and these teachings, um, I'm getting out uh, several articles um, that are sort of at the nexus of, of psychedelic studies and psychedelic science and the sociology of mental health, medicine, and, and culture. And um, on top of that, I'm kind of slowly but surely building this program um, over time to, you know, kind of inaugurate a sociology of psychedelic culture and psychedelic therapy. Uh, not many sociologists are doing this work. Some of them uh, are, are indeed out there and are beginning to get articles out, um, not typically in sociology journals just yet, but um, I'm aware of some of these folks. I, I was actually in LA uh, having margaritas with a few of them in September at the American Sociological Association Conference, which uh, I, I really uh, I you know had a great time with, with some of these folks and, and chatting with them. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, build and spread the word about bringing sociology to um, psychedelic cultures and, and psychedelic therapy. And so, you know, I, I'm really just here to uh, listen to the rest of folks and learn from them and and uh, maybe chat a little, a little bit about my course and how I can evolve it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to meet you all and to be part of this uh, collective here. And um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Jared. We, we really appreciate you um, sharing that perspective on, on the move from the PhD into the, into the new position particularly. So maybe the round table participants can take a breath for a second uh, and the audience can just uh, take a breath and reflect on some of these uh, incredible observations that, that have been put forward. Um, I want to just say that we're going to move into the second phase of uh, this workshop now, which is just a general conversation between the, the panelists where I'll put a few questions to them. And then after that, we'll move into the third phase, which will uh, allow you uh, as participants um, to ask questions. So please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, just as a bit of background, this Borghese Mellon workshop um, was uh, explicitly designed to help contextualize sociocultural and biomedical developments in psychedelic science as well as psychedelic medicine. And with the idea that uh, we had um, here, this Amanda and myself and a few others in bringing everyone together was to help bridge some gaps between the humanities and the health sciences. So this was sort of one of the foundational elements involved. And in creating this sort of structure, there are a few questions uh, that we uh, put to our evaluators uh, in our proposal. And now these are some of the questions that I want to put to our panelists as well, because we've got these, um, uh, these bright um, new projects that are being developed. And it seems to me that um, I'd be uh, out of my mind if I didn't put one of these questions to, to the group. So um, the, the first question has to do with the reconciliation of psychedelics, um, broadly conceived, obviously, as um, dangerous drugs in one instance, as sacraments in another instance, and thirdly, as medicines. And what this reconciliation process between these various categories actually looks like. And so I suppose as a uh, another sort of provocation to the group and you know, you can answer this however you wish, is who are these um, different compounds and plants ultimately benefiting in a reconciliation process? So these are pretty general questions. I've got a couple more specific questions for you, but I thought that was a maybe useful way to start. And this is not a, this is not a seminar, so I'm not going to point at anyone. So you just have to uh, unmute yourself, panelists, and, and just share uh, what it is uh, you think about these thought, these questions. I can maybe start as the 
person who most obviously, um, at least in this in this format, uh, raised the question of sacraments. Um, I think the the framing of reconciliation is a really interesting one, and I think here I would probably take my cue from post colonial science studies scholars, which maybe circles back to the comment that Jacob and I both made independently about interdisciplinary work. And what I have found to be quite helpful in my methods approach, at least, and I'd be curious to hear this um, from other folks as well, has been thinking about um, different kind of, kind of studying across different networks of knowledge. And what I mean by that more specifically is taking seriously different actors' perspective on that particular question about reconciling psychedelics as dangerous drugs, medicines, and sacraments. Um, and I, that's one of the things that I really like about that Bohashera example is the way that the scientists in that study were willing to concede their particular conception of psychedelic and hallucinogen and to recognize that in this particular Amazonian context, Bohashera was the most appropriate for the people with whom they were working and for whom they were working. That's like a second part of your question, right? Like whom benefits? Um, the origins of this study are kind of in the latter years of the Brazilian military dictatorship. There's like quite a bit of concern that Huasca is going to become um, criminalized as it has been, as it had been briefly. Um, and so, of course, the scientists are getting kind of knowledge and practice through this, but the UDV also benefits in establishing this type of, of credibility. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that's kind of like the methods cue that I that I have been using. Yeah, another way that I've thought about this question of the reconciliation is by the function of like what what function does the concept of set and setting play in contemporary psychedelic therapy? So some of the sociologists that I've looked at, maybe Jarrett can also comment on this, maybe know some of the researchers like Daniel Gifford or um, Nicholas Langlitz, for example, who's an anthropologist also, but they talk about how the current wave of psychedelic science has been built on these tactics of legitimiz legitimization, for lack of a better word, that people like in the 80s and 90s have used to uh, bring psychedelics into the mainstream. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about, or at least I used to think about more, is the role that set and setting played as a tactic of legitimate legitimization to uh, show that psychedelics aren't dangerous and that if we use them properly, they can be used in a way that's beneficial to mainstream society. So the comment that I have is basically just the role that set and setting play in uh, like navigating through these different categories and defining how we can have a harmless or less harmful way of using psychedelics, basically. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point, Andrew, and I'm seeing something very similar in my own work on the history of psychedelic therapy. A lot of the sources that I look at in this research are published books in medical journals. And this is instances where psychedelic conversion therapists are trying to communicate their findings in reputable journals, reputable scientific sources, and to make their work legible for a particular audience. And in many ways, I think the pursuit of psychedelic conversion therapy during this period was practitioners attempt to make their discipline relevant to the mainstream in a sense. Because when we think about the history of queer encounters with the psychiatric discipline, there, queerness and non-heteronormativity has long been considered a problem to be solved through medical intervention. And so when we think about this idea of scientific legitimacy, that can also bring us into questions of scientific legitimacy of purpose, right? And so, yeah, I think there's a really excellent observation you made, Andrew. Yeah, I think this uh, question of reconciliation is very interesting. And I think actually the idea that there's a single reconciliation versus reconciliations might be something that could really affect the future of psychedelics. So for example, one reconciliation I saw was I went to a National Institutes of Drug Abuse panel on psychedelics maybe two or three years ago. And the NIDA official was basically saying, you know, the recreational use of psychedelic drugs, that's the bad sort of, you know, harmful version of it. And then someone from Johns Hopkins was talking about the medical use, and that also incorporates the sacramental 
things as well, because the way that they present drugs during psychedelic therapies is almost like a sacrament and a chalice or something like that. So if we let that just be the reconciliation of these things, that's probably how this is going to go. Like basically psychedelics are going to be a medicine that is sort of presented as a sacrament in order to make it effective. And that's the combination. But a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people think that perhaps we should let psychedelics run a little bit more free. Like we should allow for recreational use of these drugs and perhaps, and how are we going to regulate um, how these drugs are provided as medicines as well? Are only certain practitioners going to be allowed to give them? Are they only going to be allowed to give them in certain ways where they're presented as a sacrament in this certain manner? Um, and there might be sort of different loci of reconciliations of these different questions in which people define how you abuse versus medical use versus sacramental things, just depending on who, who's using them. So I really think that this depends a lot on how the legal environment evolves over the next few years and who is really allowed to use psychedelics and for what purposes and if there's any sort of licensing or anything that um, focuses it in a particular way. I just want to jump in real quick. I, this is going to be rambling, but I'm, first of all, so wonderful. So great to hear all of these um, uh, various takes. And just to give a little picture of me, uh, I'm a literature scholar and cultural studies scholar working in queer and feminist theory. And I, I've been just barely starting a book that I think I'm going to call literary theory on acid. And basically in a nutshell, what I want to say is you know, if you read the work of people like Christopher Leithby, who wrote The Philosophy of Psychedelics, which I think is quite a brilliant book, right? It is the ability to do interpretive work on the psychedelic experience that seems, according to psychotherapy, to be part of what makes people heal, whatever healing looks like. And one of the arguments I want to make in this book is that in the humanities, there is one field that has dedicated its entire focus on the study of interpretation, and that's the study of literature. And what's interesting is that literature is, is, despite that, completely at the periphery of psychedelic studies and is seen as like, oh, it's just like a bunch of artists who talk about doing drugs, when in fact, like, it's actually like close reading is a deep, deep interpretive method. Um, and so I wanted uh, part of what I'm going to do in that book is reclaim the idea that close reading is a psychedelic experience by other terms that is not induced by drugs, but by like mind training. And what does it mean to like take psychedelic experience seriously? So I'm just saying that um, just to quickly introduce myself. Sorry, my interest. But part of what, is, what I wanted to say is to to speak to Andrea's point. Um, Arguably, one of the ways in which a less heteronormative, less sexist, you know, et cetera, psychedelic science is going to come from the more wild, unexpected recreational uses that it's been put to by queer people and women and other marginalized groups who can be in a dialectical relationship with science. So, you know, I think about the Coquettes, the famous glam drag crew of the 70s who were doing psychedelics like to an extreme that scientists would just like clutch their pearls, but who were basically reinventing their genders and sexualities in a really, really exciting, extraordinary way. And, and it was also sometimes irresponsible and messy. But, you know, when I presented on my work on the 1970s, I've had people in the audience say, oh, the reason we were partly in reinventing our genders and sexualities in that period is that we were all on psychedelics, like not in scientific settings. So I do think like the possibility of psychedelics not simply being a cure-all, like a way to just try to treat the symptoms of mass immiseration by scientists. Like the only way that we're going to prevent that is to allow for the wilder recreational, potentially irresponsible uses to bring us new interpretive possibilities for what psychedelics can bring to the culture. And that requires a kind of a co-constitution between those two worlds. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, that's like a long rambling comment, but. Ramsey, we appreciate the long rambling comments. Um, and I'll just say, as a historian, I often clutch my pearls. You don't have to be a scientist to clutch your pearls all the time. Uh, I'll, I'll just say too, that it's a brilliant segue into the notion of intellectual and structural next steps, a uh, question that I was going to put to uh, this panel of PhD students and early career researchers. 
So one thing that's occurred to me uh, is uh, along the lines of what Ramsey just suggested is that there have to be these new collaborations um, built into sort of an infrastructure of, again, I don't know what the appropriate term to use is psychedelic community, psychedelic industry, psychedelic space. There, these, there, these are sort of um, terms de jour uh, depending on where you're at, but I suppose what I wanted to sort of put to this panel is about, you know, what's missing in, in literature directly to Ramsey's um, observations. So what kind of directions um, would you hope happen with psychedelic scholarship, not just for their own sake, not just for the sake of the scholarship itself, but also for how it might work collaboratively with the health sciences. Um, and so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and again, uh, this whoever wants to unmute and go after it, please do. This might be one long rambling answer following in the footsteps of another. I loved your point, Ramsey. Thank you so much. And I think this hesitancy to acknowledge the contributions of psychedelic, account, psychedelic encounters outside of the clinical space speaks to a broader scientific discomfort with the notions of pleasure and its role in psychedelic experimentation, both for patients, but also for people outside of clinical spaces, for experimenters and what have you as well. So perhaps one of the future directions we can look at in biomedical research in psychedelic encounters outside of the medical gates is the role of pleasure in these things as well. So yeah, that's sort of my point there. Yeah, I agree with, I, I echo that. Um, hi, this is Dessa Bergen-Sico. I, I um, work in the area of uh, addictions and addiction studies and public health and have been um, studying the um, legalization of uh, the soft drug, so to speak, um, globally. And it, it, I think you're spot on. It's that aspect of if we can find a, uh, in, <laughs> particularly in, in the U.S. and the West, if we can find a medical benefit to it, then then um, that gets accepted and, and possibly recreational use follows afterwards. Um, and I don't know if it's just said a matter of, you know, that, that we have to sit with that for a while, um, as that's what happened really with the cannabis. Um, and if there's, you know, limited harm comes from the uh, medical legalization of and use of psychedelics, then if the spiritual growth component of it will be more accepted afterwards. There's, uh, there's so many things to be said with this lovely question. I don't even know where to begin, but, um, you know, one of the things is like, it just, I, I'm uh, hearkening back to like an old band Ted talk by um, Graham Hancock, who more or less like articulately and pointedly said that, you know, ad adults in a liberal society should be free to be the stewards of their own consciousness and that no one should tell them what the hell they can do with their, with their mind and their consciousness. Right. Um, so that's one vein, but I'm not going to go down that path because um, I can't help but to see that we have uh, Dr. Thomas Roberts here, who um, I've been kind of harping on a bit to some of my students, you know, because I'm at this Polytechnic Institute. And uh, while I have some students who are, um, uh, who are pre-med um, and, and biochemical engineering majors and so on, a, a lot of them are like, you know, future technologists and engineers and so on. And so they they they're not that interested as much as I wish that they would be as a you know someone who thinks about mental health for a living. Um, they're not as interested in some of the mental health aspects, the medicinal aspects, the clinical trials. What in fact they um, are you know a bit turned on to is you know like the fact that the biotechnological revolution was largely begun by two uh, Nobel Prize winning biochemists in Francis Crick and, and Carrie Mullis. Francis Crick, who, uh, along with James Watson, discovered the double helix uh, structure of the DNA molecule. Uh, Carrie Mollis, who developed the polymerase chain reaction, which revolutionized the study of genetics and made genetic engineering possible. 
So, you know, the other, like I'm, I'm, I'm going through this course for the first time and I'm trying to, you know, gauge these students because it's not only the first time I've taught this course, but it's the first time I've been at this institute, right? And I'm trying to gauge throughout the semester what students find most attractive. And, you know, a, a while back, I stumbled upon this 2008 um, MAPS special edition, um, you know, like article of sorts. And, and they were talking about the role played by psychedelics in technology. And, uh, and, and Dr. Roberts, I, I stumbled upon your uh, work on the single state fallacy and the multi-state mode of uh, mind body. Yeah. So I'm just going to give you a holler, uh, Dr. Roberts, while I have your attention, because I really like that um, article. And I recognize that you just um, uh, wrote about your book here, which is, you know, coming to my office as we speak. And, um, and I just want to say that, you know, Thomas uses this notion of psychotechnologies, right? And it's about just really what my whole course is about in psychedelic cultures from the framework of Western medicine and science to indigenous studies to issues of diversity and racism and sexism in psychedelia, um, you know, in Western context, right? It's just this notion of thinking otherwise, thinking differently about self, about others, about nature, about spirit, about religion, about um, creativity and problem solving. So I really love and I, I really highly recommend Thomas Roberts' book, Mind Apps, which I think came out just a couple of years ago. Dr. Roberts, yes, there it is. And um, and I just have to say that, you know, from this, this STEM perspective that my students are steeped in, right, um, that, that was a very attractive um, sort of theoretical uh, framework with which to view the mind and problem solving and, and thinking otherwise about various issues in daily life. So, uh, Dr. Roberts, nice to meet you finally. And I, I you know, uh, commend your efforts on you continuing to write in that uh, paradigm. And I really appreciate it. And um, I'll just stop now. If I can, can am I, my voice coming through? Okay, this is another very good book. The Psychedelic Policy Quagmire. Um, the the main the main editor of this and I did this. He just he's deceased now. We got twenty five scholars from various fields to write about the uses of psychedelics, largely in a non psychotherapeutic sense. The Psychedelic Policy Quagmire. It's a little expensive, so like eighty dollars or something. So you may want to ask your university library to get it. It's a very good book. And all kinds of the main people in the field, as of about what five or six years ago, have looked at using psychedelics in humanistic ways and sociological ways, as well as just the psychotherapeutic and and uh, biological ways. Um, the psychedelic policy quagmire, and I, I appreciate your mention. Actually, I taught a course in undergraduate course in psychedelics. It started in 1981. And I wrote this book for my students in that in that course, although actually the book came out after I retired. So, um, but it's, it's written to be used as an introductory book to psychedelics for people who are interested in, in the humanities and social sciences, not just in the psychotherapy. Anyway, uh, enough um, enough ads. But thank you for mentioning. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the shout out, Jared, and thank you for sharing with us, uh, Thomas. Um, you know, before we move to uh, the other questions from audience, and please feel free to put something in the chat or raise your hands. I want to make sure that the, the panelists, um, have, if they had any other thoughts about next steps, whether or not with the literature or with um, or structures, they had a chance to, to get to go after that question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, Jacob. Okay. Um, I guess my main comment on this, which is something something that uh we're doing pretty good at, is like, you know, at the academic at academic lectures, there's often that one sort of wacky person that's randomly there. Well, those people are often excluded, I would say, in most cases, but I think we should really include them here because a lot of the like the crazy hippie people. Like they don't have ideas that exactly align with what we think of as an academic approach to things. But I think if we include them in our discussions, we might really take things in a way that's unexpected. Because I, I went to this conference called Psychedemia recently, where there were academics and non-academics. And this 
cross between these two groups of people was incredibly interesting. For example, one of the main speakers was William Leonard Ricard, who produced most of the LSD in the United States for decades. And he talked about his experiences in prison um, and also about what he thought the values of psychedelics were. So having someone like that that's actually involved in academic discussions, I think will really prevent us from becoming another arcane field of study that's not directly connected to anything in reality. And I see some of this tendency to create walled gardens right now in psychedelic studies, where, for example, you know, if you try to create a space where someone who has crazy ideas is not welcome, where you have to have some sort of credential or something to participate. And there's certainly reasons to do that in certain cases. But if someone is respectful and they're not, you know, not pedantically like, you know, talking over everyone or something like that, I think we should really work to include people that are not academics and psychedelics, especially because there's this whole amateur field of like academic interest in this, this subject. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And some of us, some of us work with them, you know, some of us interview them, some of us like per collaborate with them. Um, and I think maybe before we move to the q and I just wanted to respond quickly to the comment that Dessa, if I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly, raised earlier about um, uh, the kind of psychedelic legalization. And I think for me, this raises an interesting comparative question about psychedelic exceptionalism versus like decriminalization and legalization writ large with drugs, including those that are considered hard. Um, and, you know, there are lots of people who have written about this in more eloquent ways than I ever will. But that to me seems like an important conversation for us to continue to have with people who work in drug policy, whether that is, you know, substances that are considered to be psychedelic or those that are a little bit more broadly defined as narcotics or drugs. Um, because kind of like prefacing this question that was posed in terms of intersectionality, um, you know, we know that there are historic reasons why certain drugs are legalized more rapidly than others, and they usually have to do with things like class, race, ethnicity, citizenship, and disability, and gender. Um, and so I think that's something that is important for us to keep thinking about. Thanks, Taylor. Good points. Right. So, I mean, that, Taylor, leads me into just reciting this question from day to the panelists and maybe you all want to um, have a crack at responding. So as you identify issues of intersectionality in your studies, how does your personal approach to inquiry change? So that, that's an intriguing question. I guess speaking from my own research, one of the things I'm very interested in is how the lived effective subjective experience of conversion therapy has changed from over this 100 year period I trace in my dissertation from 1910 to 2010. And I think that this has changed my perspective on perhaps future directions in psychedelic research and scientific inquiry more generally, because I think in the historiographical and scientific literature, not so much scientific literature, but in the historiographical literature, there is an emphasis on practitioners, their beliefs, their perspectives, their ideas, their theories. And perhaps if we pay more attention to the experience of patients, that might be a better, more inclusive direction for research in the future. Putting patients at the center of our narrative really encourages us to think about the ways that psychedelic therapies, psychedelic use more generally can be more beneficial, more equitable, and can perhaps avoid some of the pitfalls we've seen in history of practitioners who perhaps are more concerned with advancement of the field, their own career advancement, their own research objectives, than the actual concerns of patients under their care. So, yeah. I see no further questions at this stage. Uh, I wanna also um, just suggest that uh, the Borghese Mellon workshop is um, going to have legs and move forward in the future. This is merely the fall 2022 iteration. I'm very much looking forward to having future conversations. 
if you're interested in taking stock of some of the past conversations that we've had, they're all available on YouTube. So we have recorded these, and this one is currently being recorded. You can go to the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy, the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy this is a nonprofit organization which has uh, a Twitter channel and a YouTube channel. And uh, you can, uh, again, watch this amazing conversation over again um, or use it for teaching purposes. Uh, and there's also a number of other uh, valuable uh, lectures there in the past. I